Good afternoon. We are pleased to welcome you to the Washington Labs Academy webinar series. We hope you find the next hour or so useful and informative. We have developed our webinar series to deal with some of the technical and administrative issues that our customers face on a day-to-day -day basis. We recognize that engineering challenges can be complex and we're always looking for ways to support the technology industry. Before we begin, a few housekeeping details. First, I hope everyone can see the title slide on their computer. A recording of this presentation will be sent to all attendees. A full screen view may be preferred. Your selection at your computer can be done by using the menu panel in the menu on your screen. Go to view and then select full screen. We estimate that the main bulk of the presentation will take approximately one hour. There will be an extensive amount of material being covered today. Should we not get to your questions, please send any questions or comments related to this topic to questions at WLL.com. If you'd like a rodent sports expert to contact you for a demo, or if you have more questions related to a project, please indicate that in your email. Make sure you include your name, your company, your email, your phone number, and the zip code. And now, I'd like to introduce our presenters. Jonathan Koch has over 10 years in the EMC EMI industry, with the majority of his time being spent in a EMC EMI test house or compliance lab. He joined Roden Swartz two years ago. In that time, he has performed testing on many types of devices, from small and large medical components, automotive devices, all the way up to the power generation and distribution systems for the 787 aircraft. Previously, he was the road team lead for four years with Ingenium Testing and TS. His responsibilities include performing high-level pulse and average radio frequency testing to DO-160 and MIL standard at customers' facilities. He has experienced testings with many different standards, including DO-160, D616050, ABD, MIL standard, CISPR, ISO-17025, and some custom requirements from aircraft manufacturers. Our other presenter for today is Jeremy Klein who is responsible for EMC products and systems for Roden Swartz North America. Over the last 10 plus years, Jeremy has specialized in both field and lab applications for multiple industries and has authored several white papers and patents. So without further ado, let's turn our attention to exploring EMC basics and standards with Jonathan Koch and Jeremy Klein. Hi, Jonathan and Jeremy. It is all yours. Take it away. Okay, great. Thank you. I want to say thank you to Washington Labs for this opportunity and all of you for attending our webinar on exploring EMC basics and standards. I'm excited to talk to you more about EMC testing. We have myself and Jeremy Klein here today to talk more about these topics. I will cover an introduction to EMC testing and Jeremy will talk later on an introduction to EMC standards. With that, I will begin our discussion on an introduction to EMC testing. Today we will cover some various topics and points of interest around EMC testing and what it entails. The biggest question people have when talking about EMC testing is why is it important? When people who are new to product development begin to design a product for the first time, they think they can just produce the product and start selling it. But there is another very important step. Products are required to be tested to see if they will be affected or interfere with other products in their vicinity when they are in operation. This is where EMC compliance comes into place, and it is important because nearly 80% of all products will fail during first pass testing. There are steps that can be taken and tests that can be done to mitigate this failure rate, and this is called pre-compliance testing. 
When pre-compliance testing is performed, those products will have a 60% or higher chance of passing during first pass testing than those that did not. Considering most EMI testing costs over $2,000 per 8 hour shift, this can be very expensive. And when we're talking about EMC testing, time is money. This is money that could be better spent on engineering or better yet, purchasing better equipment for the lab instead of wasting it on unneeded testing. Now that we have talked about why EMC testing is important, let's talk about why it is needed. In today's forever evolving world, and as we push through the digital age, more and more products are being built with electronic controls. Things that used to be controlled via hydraulics are now being controlled through wires, or fly-by-wire as it is called. Even in the vehicle you drove today, you no longer control the throttle body on the car when the gas pedal is pushed. In fact, it is controlled by a computer that tells the engine how much to accelerate or decelerate when your foot is removed from the pedal. Because of these advancements in technology, it has become even more important to test for EMC compliance to ensure when your cell phone rings or the radio is turned on in the vehicle, it doesn't affect the onboard computers, for example. One of the things we are testing for during EMC testing is external impacts. These impacts are caused by items that are not related to your device you are building or device under test, but they may be in close enough proximity to cause issues or anomalies within your device. Then we have internal impacts. These impacts can be caused by items that are incorporated within your device you are building. For example, if you use an off-the-shelf chip inside your device under test and it creates emissions that cause your device to have an anomaly, this is called an internal impact. Next you have human impacts. These impacts are caused by the human interaction with your device. For example, ESD or electrostatic discharge. This electrostatic discharge event can cause electricity to flow through the circuit boards of your device and cause failures on the boards. These are just some of the examples and reasons why we need to do EMC testing. On this slide, we can see some of the interactions happening we talked about on the previous slide. These are common interactions you would see happening in your living room if you could see RF flowing through the air. Each one of these devices could have impacts on each other or to the device itself that could cause another device to fail. For example, receiving a phone call on your mobile phone could create an emission spike at a frequency, which could then cause an issue with your desktop computer or your smart controlled lighting, for example. Nowadays, even refrigerators in households are becoming connected devices, where you can look inside the refrigerator remotely using an app on your smartphone to see what ingredients you have to make a meal with for dinner tonight. Some refrigerators even have displays on them where you can see the weather or look up a recipe. As we find more and more products in our home going digital, EMC testing is becoming more and more important. Now let's take a look outside our homes and into the outdoor environment. Here we can find even more devices that are considered connected devices that again can have impacts from within the device or cause impacts to each other. It could be as simple as an RF interference signal causing static on a radio station, or that a frequency is being emitted to cause the radio in your car to stop working. Even worse, think about a lightning strike hitting a broadcast tower and the frequency content that could be emitted in such an event. Or even worse, what if the lightning strike hit your vehicle? All of these can create RF emissions in the air which have the potential to cause anomalies to your device and again show why EMC testing is important. Now that we talked about why EMC testing is important, why we need EMC testing, and we have shown some examples of the EMC environments, let's talk about what EMC means. EMC, or electromagnetic compatibility, is an important criterion of product safety and product quality. Also, the definition of EMC is the capability of an electrical device or system to operate in its electromagnetic environment without either disturbing it which means producing emissions or EMI, or being disturbed by it, which is susceptibility, immunity, or EMS. It is also important to keep in mind that EMC encompasses both EMI and EMS testing. As we talked about in the previous slide, EMC encompasses both EMI and EMS, as you can see on this slide. 
But each category goes even further than that, as you can see here. Both EMI and EMS have different categories of testing. Both EMI and EMS have a conducted and radiated emissions testing method. As you can see in the slide, EMI testing is synonymous with emissions testing. In this slide, you can see an example of a refrigerator emitting RF energy and signals over the air to the washing machine. To measure and quantify these type of over-the-air RF emissions, we would use radiated emissions. If we were to suspect that the RF emissions was coming out on the interconnecting or powered cable bundle of the device, we would then use conducted emissions testing. Also in the slide above, you can see an example of a computer display radiating RF energy and signals over the air to the refrigerator. To simulate this type of environment in EMC testing, we would use susceptibility testing or EMS testing. EMS testing can also be done via conducted or radiated testing methods. This ensures the device under test is not disturbed or does not have any anomalies while being bombarded with RF energy or signals. Radiated susceptibility testing would produce the signals over the air to the device under test, and conducted susceptibility testing would inject the signals onto the interconnecting or power cable bundle of the device under test. In this slide, we can see some examples of EMI emissions from a computer again, but here I want to talk about the different types of emissions and how they can be produced. In EMC testing, there are a couple types of radiation electrical and magnetic, which we're going to talk about. When we talk about magnetic radiation, these are emissions in the low frequency band, which can be produced by things like motor generators or power inverters. Because of the low frequency power inversion or power generating that is happening inside these types of devices, this tends to give off frequencies in the magnetic frequency range. With electrical radiation, this can be caused by anything from chipsets to capacitors to improper grounding and many more items. Once this radiation is produced within a unit, it then has to find its way out in order to provide a radiated or conducted emission that can be measured via conducted or radiated emissions testing. The emission usually finds their way out of the device and out into the air or cabling via aperture coupling or cable coupling. Here's an example of EMS testing, where we generate a field or inject a current or voltage into the device under test. For radiated immunity or susceptibility, this is typically done with an antenna aimed directly at the device under test while bombarding it with RF energy and trying to create anomalies. For conducted susceptibility, we use many methods for this type of test, depending on the standard we are testing to. We do this to try and get the RF energy into the unit and try to cause disturbances. A couple of examples of the used methods include BCI, or bulk current injection, where a current injection clamp is clamped onto the cable under test, or CDN, which stands for coupling-decoupling network method, where the cable is connected to the CDN and the energy is coupled in through the cable to the device under test. There are a couple other methods as well. I can remember one radiated susceptibility test I was performing where I made a cockpit display and think the plane was flying upside down and backwards as shown on the display. This is a very real world example of why EMS testing is important. When we talk about EMC testing methods, there are some terms and acronyms to be aware of. On the emissions side of things for radiated emissions, it is referred to as RE or further it can be classified as RFRE for radiated frequency radiated emissions. Similarly, conducted emissions is referred to as CE or RFCE for radio frequency conducted emissions. Just to note here, you can also have MFCE or MFRE, which stands for magnetic field conducted or radiated emissions. Also, as another note, you will hear immunity or susceptibility used interchangeably. These mean the same things and are just referred to in different industries differently. In the aviation side of EMC testing, it is usually referred to as susceptibility, while the automotive and commercial EMC testing worlds typically use the word immunity. When referring to the acronyms for those testing methods, you will similarly use RI, 
or RS, for radiated immunity or radiated susceptibility, while CI and CS are used for conducted immunity or conducted susceptibility. These tests can also be tagged with RF and MF for radiated or magnetic frequency differentiators as well, as we saw on the emission side. When we talk about radiated emissions testing, we are talking about emissions measurements that's being made with an antenna over the air. In this example, you will see what a basic radiated emission setup would look like. Here we are using the Rodian Schwartz HK116E biconical antenna, which is connected with a coaxial cable to the Rodian Schwartz ESR receiver. On the left side of the screen, you will see an example of a radiated emissions hardware setup using the Rodian Schwartz Electro software. During radiated emissions testing, we are using the antenna to measure the field being emitted by the device under test. We then send that signal to the receiver where it is measured accurately. On the receiver or in the test software being used, the transducer and attenuation factors are applied in order to give us that correlated actual field strength measurement. Some of the antennas that are typically used during emissions testing are the rod or monopole antenna, biconical antenna, log periodic antenna, biconolog antenna, large horn antenna, and small horn antenna. These represent the most often used antenna for radiated emissions testing. It is also important to note that radiated emissions testing is performed in different ways based on the standard you are testing to. For example, mill standard and automotive testing do radiated emissions testing with a device under test on a test table and the antenna on a fixed tripod one meter away from the device under test. Whereas during commercial testing, the device is placed on a table, which is on a turntable, and the turntable is spun 360 degrees in order to measure all sides of the device under test. The antenna is also mounted on an antenna mass, which is swept from one to four meters in height while the turntable is being rotated. The antenna and antenna mass are typically placed at a measurement distance of three 5 or 10 meters away from the device under test. There are some standards which require even further distances, like 30 meter testing, for example. This slide shows another type of radiated emissions testing I wanted to talk about. Previously, we talked mostly about electric field or radiative frequency radiated emissions testing. Some standards like automotive and mill standards require you to also do magnetic field rated emissions testing. In this test configuration, rather than placing the antenna at one meter away and measuring the electric field emissions from the device under test, the magnetic field receiving loop is placed within five to 10 centimeters of the device under test, and then the measurements are taken. Most times the antenna usually has a spacer built into the receiving loop to ensure proper spacing during the test. As you can also see, the frequency range of this magnetic field radiated emissions test is between 30 Hz and 100 kHz, whereas most electric field radiated emissions tests start higher in frequency, typically between 2 and 100 MHz, but some do start with a monopole or rod antenna at 150 kHz. Here we see a different type of radiated emissions test setup. In this slide, we have an emissions test setup that is performed on devices with intentional radiators according to MIL standard RE103. This test setup measures the spurious emissions and harmonic outputs from the transmitter inside the device under test. The test is used to ensure that even while the device under test is transmitting as it is intended to do, it is not creating any out of band or harmonic signals that could cause unneeded disturbances to nearby devices. One further step in making emissions measurements of any kind is to be able to compare the data you are taking to the limit line of the standard you are testing to. For example, above is the FCC and CISPR limit lines for CE and RE testing. You will see a class A and a class B limit. It is very important to know which limit line you must meet for the device you are testing or designing. For the most part, items used in an industrial or commercial environment must meet Class A 
while devices designed for use in residential environments would have to meet class B. You also need to equate the reading from the receiver to the actual limit line. In this case, the antenna factor of the antenna and the attenuation factor from the cable must be accounted for in your measurements. This can be done in the receiver or the test software you are using. Another thing to keep in mind during your product design and EMC testing is what country your product will be sold or used in. As you can see here, depending on if your product is sold into the USA or the EU, for example, this will determine which class you must meet. The EU and USA are backwards in terms of what class you must meet for residential and commercial applications. So it is very important to consider where your product will be sold and used. Another thing to note is as emissions limits increase, so do the immunity or disturbance level that your product must meet during the susceptibility testing of your device under test. When we talk about conducted emissions testing, we are talking about an emissions measure that's being made with a current probe or LISN, which stands for Line Impedance Stabilization Network. This is used to measure the voltage or current flowing on the cable under test. In this example, you will see what a basic conducted emissions setup would look like. Here we are using the Rodian Schwartz ENV216 LISN. This is connected via a coaxial cable to the Rodian Schwartz ESR receiver. On the right side of the screen, you will see an example of a conducted emissions hardware setup using the Rodian Schwartz Electra software. Some tests, like MIL standard CE102, for example, have a pretest or verification required before you can run your testing. This pretest is done to ensure all components within the measurement path are performing and measuring accurately. This ensures the quality of the data taken during the actual testing phase. You can see the differences in the test setups above. During the verification phase, a signal which is similar to a signal that would be seen during testing is input into the LISN, while the waveform is also verified on an oscilloscope to be the correct shape and amplitude which meets their specified limit. Once the signal is set up correctly, the measurement is triggered on the receiver to ensure the measurement path is measuring accuracy. This is one step that most mill standard tests take to ensure the accuracy of the measurements during testing. Some other methods of pretest from other standards would include using a known source like a comb generator to verify the current measured data against legacy taken data from the same test. This is done because when performing EMI testing, the integrity of the data being taken is vitally important. Now let's move on to the susceptibility or immunity side of things. Above you will see an example of a radius susceptibility or immunity hardware setup from the Rodian Schwartz Electra software. During radiative susceptibility testing, if you remember from before, we are bombarding the device under test with radio frequency waves to try and create anomalies within the device. This is accomplished by using a signal generator to drive a signal into an amplifier. The output of the amplifier is connected to an antenna which then takes the signal it is receiving and broadcasts those radio frequency signals over the air towards the device under test. During the testing, the field probe measures the field being generated in the environment. Radiated susceptibility testing is usually performed one of two ways. The first way is with live leveling of the electric field being measured on the field probe. The second way is before the device under test is placed into the environment, a pre-calibration is done to determine the needed power that needs to be delivered to the amplifier to develop a certain field strength or test level in the environment. The measurement of the level of the delivered power needed is called the forward power measurement. In the second method, this power level is monitored on the sample port of the amplifier or an external directional coupler to ensure the needed test level is being produced inside the test environment. Now during conducted susceptibility, the transmitting antenna is replaced by an injection device like a bulk current injection probe 
or injection clamp as can be seen on the hardware setup above for the Rodian Schwartz Electra software. In conducted susceptibility testing, there is typically a pre-calibration done, but a live leveling method is used in some standards as well. When performing conducted susceptibility testing using the BCI or bulk cable injection testing method, the injection and monitoring probes are placed on the wire under test and the field is delivered to the probes from the amplifier output using the pre-calibrated forward power level determined during the pre-calibration. The entire frequency range of the test is swept along using the required modulations from the standard while determining if the device under test is susceptible to the radio frequency waves being induced onto its power or interconnecting cable bundles. Here you can see the breakdown of the United States radio spectrum frequency allocations and who or what items are allowed to trip broadcast in the allocated frequency spectrum ranges. I know this is difficult to look at and see any kind of details, but it's important to know that in this frequency spectrum that EMI testing takes place from DC to 18 gigahertz typically, but can be extended up to 40 gigahertz or even beyond as we see in new technologies like automotive radar application, which are pushing higher in frequency. 5G is another example of another technology that is also pushing the frequency content higher as well. And there are some tests that even can be required up into the 200 and 300 gigahertz range. As we previously talked about frequency spectrum, we can now look a little deeper into the frequency ranges that typically are used for EMC testing. Yes, on the previous slide, I said DC to 18 or 40 gigahertz, but more often than not, the testing is completed between nine kilohertz and six gigahertz, and sometimes extending up to 18. This depends on the standard you are testing to. Another important detail to note is that most EMC issues occur between the range of nine kilohertz to six gigahertz, with the majority happening below one gigahertz. When we come across anomalies or the failure to meet a limit line during conducted emissions testing, this tends to occur below 30 megahertz. On the other side, radiated emissions anomalies or issues tend to occur above 30 megahertz. Let's talk briefly about how electromagnetic waves are created. When you have an electric current flowing through a wire, whether it is inside your device or an interconnecting cable outside of your device, there is also a magnetic field that is generated in the space around it. When this electric current has a change in the amount of current or frequency content, it can then create a magnetic wave in the space around it that is also changing. An antenna within your device then can pick up that signal and convert that electromagnetic wave into an RF emissions that can be coming out of your device. It is also important to note that those antennas can be the source of an anomaly during susceptibility testing. This is because that antenna can also act as a receiving antenna as well. When this happens, the signal is picked up by the antenna and then transmitted into the cable or into the air inside your device. This can then be picked up by a sensitive chip or other parts inside your device, which could subsequently cause it to fail. Now that we talked about how electromagnetic waves are created and how an antenna can take an electromagnetic signal and propagate that signal into the air, let's talk about frequency and wavelength. When we look at the frequency and wavelength chart above, you can see some typical EMC frequencies and how their wavelength is. This is very important information to pay attention to when you're designing your device under test. When I mentioned on the previous slide about an antenna inside your device being able to propagate an electromagnetic signal or receive a signal, this does not always refer to an actual physical antenna. In fact, when you have a cable that is roughly one quarter wavelength of the frequency of concern, this cable or slot in your device can act as a very good antenna at those frequencies. A cable or slot in your device under test at 1 20th of a wavelength makes a very poor radiator for frequencies of concern. And so it is important to consider these wavelengths and intentionally generated frequencies 
from within your device when you're planning how to build them. For example, if you had a chip inside with a 1 GHz radiator, which has a wavelength of 30 centimeters, you would not want to have your cables inside your device be 7.5 centimeters. Instead, if you can make those cables 1.5 centimeters or less, you would prevent the ability for EMI issues to propagate inside and outside of your unit under test. As a summary to what we have discussed today, we talked about the following topics. We talked about why EMC testing is important. We talked about why we needed EMC testing. We talked about what is EMC. We also have talked about the parts that make up EMC testing. Number one, emissions testing or interference testing, which measures the electromagnetic signals being emitted by the EUT to determine if these emissions exceed the permissible limits. Number two, we talked about immunity testing or susceptibility testing. This verifies if a device can function properly when exposed to significant levels of RF energy. There are numerous examples of devices that have malfunctioned or failed when exposed to high levels of RF energy, in some cases resulting in injury and all the way up to death. In fact, the effects of EMI have been suspected in numerous incidences in which control systems have failed, chips have run off course, aircraft have crashed, and medical devices such as pacemakers and defibrillators have malfunctioned. The first event in which the effects of EMI were recorded and documented was the 1967 explosion on the USS Forestrel, in which a rocket was accidentally fired due to an EMC electrical power surge. These cases highlight the critical need to consider EMC testing in the design and integration of electronic devices into any given environment. Now that we have covered a brief introduction to EMC testing, let's move on and talk about an introduction to EMC standards. I will turn the floor over now to our North American EMC product manager, Jeremy Klein, who will cover this in more depth. Okay, great. Thank you, Jonathan. I'd also like to welcome everyone from my side to today's presentation. As Jonathan mentioned, now that you have some EMC basics under your belt, let's go ahead and talk about some standards. During today's presentation, we'll be covering a couple different topics. We'll start with some basics of EMC standards, such as what they are, who makes them, and an overview of the more popular standards in the EMC industry. Then we'll actually take a closer look into industry-specific EMC standards, including some of the more popular standards in the commercial, aerospace and defense, automotive, and medical industries. Last but not least, we'll summarize some of the more major points learned during this presentation. To begin, let's start with the most basic question of all. What exactly are EMC standards? Well, in short, EMC standards help to make measurements comparable and repeatable by defining the test methods, the appropriate test environment, and the test equipment needed to meet a particular standard. Standards have the purpose of bringing harmonization to EMC testing, sometimes from a global perspective, but at least certainly from a regional perspective. To accomplish this, there are several standards bodies which exist who define these standards from both an emissions and immunity perspective. We'll take a closer look at who makes EMC standards in just a minute. But before we move on, one of the biggest takeaways is the fact that the aim of EMC in general is to ensure the reliability and safety of all types of systems wherever they happen to be used and exposed to electromagnetic environments. EMC concerns exist in any industry which develops, tests, and or manufactures electronic equipment. EMC concerns also exist anywhere where there is a reliance on omnipresent electronic elements and items such as heart pacemakers, vehicle braking systems, laptop computers, air traffic control systems, and so much more. EMC standards are defined by both international and regional organizations, or committees on behalf of administrative bodies. Sometimes, administrative and or regulatory bodies word the EMC standards and regulations themselves. In general, there are many standards bodies, and this slide certainly does not show them all. Instead, this slide shows an example hierarchy that exists for commercial standards in particular. The International Electrotechnical Commission, known as the IEC for short, 
is based out of Switzerland and has global coverage of its international standards and other technical publications, and has been deeply involved with EMC for many years now. CISPR is a standards body which is part of the IEC and directly references IEC global standards and typically separates the standards into two major categories, EMI and EMS, or emissions and susceptibility, respectively. Several major standards bodies across the world exist to define regional EMC standards, one of which is the FCC in the United States. It's important to note now before we go forward any more that there are a great number of EMC standards out there, and this presentation will in no way address all of them. Instead, we're going to talk about some of the more common standards seen in each major industry area shown on this slide. We'll walk through four major industry areas where EMC standards exist. This will include the commercial, aerospace defense, automotive, and medical industries. As a quick note, you can see some applicable standards listed in each major area. Take note that CISPR 11 is a standard that applies to both commercial and medical equipment testing. This is partially because medical equipment can be considered a subcategory of commercial equipment testing, but for the purpose of today's presentation, we've separated out medical equipment into its own area because there are so many unique standards and requirements within this area of testing. Underneath each category, you can also see which standardization bodies and or individual companies exist to create the standards for that given area. Again, this is not an exhaustive list by any means, but you'll see this slide a number of times during this presentation because we'll be talking about some major highlights in each one of these areas. So, let's first take a look at commercial EMC standards. In this area, we're talking about requirements which govern the development of industrial scientific medical equipment, known as ISM equipment for short, consumer electronics, IT household equipment, and lighting equipment. And there's certainly many more examples of what would classify as commercial equipment. Some applicable standards include CISPR 11, CISPR 35, and the EN61000 series of standards. And then you also have several product specific standards. So at this point, let me expand on what is really meant by product-specific standards. As their name implies, the IEC's basic EMC publications specify the general conditions or rules necessary for achieving electromagnetic compatibility. They also serve as building blocks for the IEC technical committees that develop EMC product standards, such as the ones I just mentioned on the last slide. There are in fact a few different types of standards that can be created. Basic standards, generic standards, and product standards. Generic EMC standards are important building blocks for the development of new product standards. Not only do they provide technical background, but they also fill the gap, if you will, during the time taken to develop a product standard. EMC product standards may apply either to particular products, such as electricity meters and printed circuit boards, or to a group of products that have common general characteristics that may operate in the same environment and have neighboring fields of application. Medical devices, IT equipment, and low voltage household equipment are good examples of such groups in the latter case. These publications are known as EMC product family standards. So a major takeaway from this slide is that whenever someone needs to test a certain product or piece of equipment, in general, they're going to be looking for a product-specific standard first. If that doesn't exist, a more broad generic standard can apply instead. And by similar logic, if the generic standard doesn't exist, then a basic standard is referred to and used. For the commercial space, this slide gives you a pretty good idea of just how many standards exist out there. As shown at the beginning of the presentation, standards are typically split between EMI and EMS testing, or emissions and susceptibility. You can see this division between EMI and EMS standards on this slide. Underneath EMI and EMS, you can also see that several different standards exist for different types of EMC measurements within each of those spaces. Some examples include conducted power measurements, harmonics or flicker measurements, and magnetic field measurements, just to name a few. The bottom most part of the table shows individual standards 
which fit into each respective category. And again, this is not exhaustive, but it does give us an idea as to how many standards are really out there. So that's just a quick look at the commercial space. Let's move on to taking a look at the aerospace and defense industry segment. In this segment, standards are created to test the reliability and safety of aircraft, ships, submarines, land-based equipment, and more. Common standards in this space include MIL standard 461 and 464, as well as a standard called DO160. In the aerospace and defense industry, standards are created for applicable subsystems, including those targeted for land, sea, air, and space applications. And as you might expect, the military heavily uses these standards for each of those respective use cases. In this section, we're going to take a closer look into the MIL standard family of standards, as well as DO160, as they are arguably the most common. To begin, let's realize that MIL standard 461 describes requirements for subsystems, whereas MIL standard 464 des describes requirements for systems. DO160, on the other hand, focuses on the environmental conditions and test procedures for airborne equipment. Similar to the commercial industry, the standards in aerospace and defense are also split between emission and susceptibility. Furthermore, there are two ways to perform EMC measurements. One is via conducted testing, which suggests that your device or equipment under test is connected via a cable. And the other way is via radiated testing, which suggests that the signal of interest is over the air and you're using an antenna to receive the signal energy. In the A&D world, you'll often hear acronyms such as what's shown on the right-hand side of the slide, things like RE and CS, which stand for radiated emissions and conducted susceptibility, respectively. Within MIL standard 461, there have been several radiated and conducted tests defined for both the EMI and EMS testing worlds, which goes beyond the scope of this presentation. MIL standard has been around for quite some time, and here's a quick look at the history of the 461, 462, and 463 standards. Starting with revision B for MIL standard 461, there has been a major new revision roughly every six to eight years. And as of the time of this recording, definitions for MIL standard 461H are already underway. Each major project in the aerospace and defense industry typically calls out exactly which MIL standard revision must be used. Let's take a closer look at the standards that exist in this space and who creates them. As this slide shows, there are a number of standards bodies in the aerospace and defense area. As we just talked about, MIL standard and DO160 are very common and are in fact created by different standardization bodies. The Radio Technical Commission for Aeronautics, or RTCA, created DO160 and the MIL standard family of standards were created by the Department of Defense. Notice that this slide also shows CISPR, which was previously mentioned during the commercial section of this presentation. Shaded in gray because it is not considered to be a dedicated aerospace and defense standards body, CISPR standards still play an important role in the A&D space because several A&D standards in fact directly and or indirectly reference one of its standards called CISPR 1611. Starting from the left-hand side of the slide, S-121, a common standard for space vehicles, references MIL standard 461. And if you study MIL standard 461 in more detail, you'll see that it in turn references ANSI C63.2, another standard considered to be on the commercial side. Then ANSI C63.2 references CISPR 1611. So you might be wondering, what's so special about CISPR 1611, and why does the A&D community care about it? Well, this standard is important when it comes to choosing test equipment, because CISPR 1611 outlines acceptable requirements for what's known as a test apparatus, which would be something like an EMI test receiver or spectrum analyzer. On the next slide, we'll take a look at how this translates to MIL standard 461 specifically. When this video was recorded, the current revision of MIL standard 461 was revision G, 
Recall that MIL standard 461 references ANSI C63.2, which in turn references CISPR 1611. Now directing our attention to footnote number two seen on this slide underneath the table, we can see that FFT measurement techniques are therefore accepted in the MIL standard 461G standard as long as the measurement receiver allows the direct input of the parameters in table two for both FFT time domain and frequency stepped modes in the same manner. This is important because FFT time domain based measurements are officially accepted in the A&D community. These types of measurements save a lot of overall measurement time. Now let's move on to the automotive industry where several standards exist for vehicles and their sub-assemblies such as control equipment, infotainment equipment, and communication equipment. In this space, there are both country-specific standards as well as OEM-specific standards. Let's take a closer look at how these standards are broken down. In general, cars these days are essentially a large collection of small computers working together simultaneously. This in turn provides several EMC-related challenges, so in the automotive industry, standards are loosely separated by internal and external use cases. Internal EMC testing is considered to be testing for anything that causes interference between subparts inside the vehicle. Some example use cases include testing the anti-lock brake system, the navigation system, the motors for the windshield wipers, and more as shown on the slide. External EMC testing, on the other hand, is considered to be testing for interference between the vehicle itself and another vehicle, or perhaps the environment surrounding the vehicle. Example use cases include lightning testing, mobile phone testing, electrostatic discharge or ESD, and more as you can see on the slide. For vehicles and electronic subassemblies or ESAs, there are a number of country specific standard bodies around the world that define appropriate EMC standards for that given area. At the same time, there also exists some global bodies who provide requirements from a global basis. That includes standard bodies such as CISPR, who we saw in both the commercial and aerospace defense areas in this presentation. And last but not least, car manufacturers themselves even create their very own standards. And we're gonna see some specific examples of those on the next slide. Here's a quick look at several specific standards that exist in different parts of the world. As mentioned moments ago, you can see some OEM specific standards such as those from GM, Volkswagen, BMW, and more. You can also see several standards from the global standards body such as CISPR. And you can also see some regional standards for Europe, the United States, and Asia. It is of course necessary one more time to mention that this is in no way an exhaustive list, but it does give you an idea of what exists in the automotive space. Last but not least, let's take a look at medical EMC standards. In this industry, standards exist to ensure proper reliability and safety of medical devices, diagnostic machines, hearing aids, and more. The applicable standards in this area include CISPR 11 and a few specific standard families from the IEC. Within the medical community, which standard applies can also depend on the testing environment in which a device is primarily used. Looking at the table shown on this slide, we're looking at a couple different testing use cases, conducted emissions, or CE, and radiated emissions, or RE. If you're testing a device to be used within a hospital, for example, you would refer to CISPR 11 Class A. If the device's primary use case would be at home or at a small clinic, however, you would refer to CISPR 11 Class B, which has slightly different requirements than Class A. As you might imagine, there are a lot of ins and outs with, within EMC standards, and things change from edition to edition. Once you have identified the proper standard, however, everything becomes fairly black and white with the ultimate goal to ensure reliability and safety of whatever, whatever it is you might be testing. To wrap things up for this side of the EMC standards world, this slide shows several test standards typically used in the medical industry. It's interesting to note that a good majority of failures in the medical industry are due to radiated testing of any kind, 
and or conducted emissions. There's also a fair amount of electrostatic discharge or ESD testing according to global IEC standards. This table also gives an idea of how requirements can change from addition to addition of the same standard. For this very reason, it's important to keep yourself up to date as much as possible on all applicable standards to the testing that you must perform. So over the course of today's presentation, we learned about what EMC standards are, who defines them, and what some common standards are across the commercial, airspace and defense, automotive, and medical industries. Although this was nowhere close to an exhaustive discussion of every EMC standard, we now have an understanding of the differences between basic standards, generic standards, and product-specific standards. In some industries, manufacturers make their own standards, like what we saw in the automotive area. And in other industries, the testing environment governs which standard is used, such as what we saw in the medical area. Overall, we've learned that there are many nuances to EMC standards, but once the correct one is applied, the standard will help define the rules for testing, which includes the methodology required, as well as the equipment and testing environment required to ensure the reliability and safety of whatever device is being tested. Okay, with that, that concludes today's presentation. Before we move into the questions and answers session, I wanted to take a moment to let you know about our new educational series we call Everything Test. It covers everything from the fundamentals of RF to digital and EMC testing. This series will improve your understanding of basic test and measurement concepts, techniques, and instrument optimization across a wide range of applications. Everything Test is now available on demand, allowing you to learn at your own pace. Please visit road-schwartz.com slash everything test to learn more. And with that, on behalf of myself and Jonathan, we thank you for attending today's presentation. Let's go ahead and check the chat to see if we can answer some questions. Is there a difference between immunity and sensibility? Yeah, so this is Jeremy here. I'll take this one. Um, in the EMC world, those are pretty much synonymous terms. Both immunity and susceptibility are analogous in what we call EMS testing, which as a reminder stands for electromagnetic susceptibility. Uh, but that's an interesting semantics issue because the terms immunity and susceptibility are pretty much opposite of each other when you get right down to it. A susceptibility is the tendency for a device under test to malfunction or completely break down uh, in the presence of unwanted emissions. Whereas immunity is more about the ability of a device under test to function correctly in the presence of unwanted emissions. So I'd say all in all, they're pretty close in definition. One defines when something will break and the other one defines how something will actually function correctly. But for us in the EMC world, the same type testing determines both of those different terms. So it just depends on which industry you're in. One of those terms is preferred over the other, but they're, they're very closely related. All right, thank you for that. I have another question, if you don't mind. Um, sure. On one of the slides, there was something called a lizen. What exactly is that? Right, yeah, I, I believe that was on a slide related to conducted emissions um, because lizens are used quite often for that type of testing. Uh, lizen stands for a line impedance stabilization network. Um, in short, basically a lizen is, is a type of low pass filter you typically put this between a power source, say the power outlet on the wall, for example, and your device under test to create uh, a known impedance is the ultimate goal. Uh, I think it's also important to note that the power coming out of a wall typically in an AC outlet is not the cleanest signal. So when you use a LISN, it's filtering out RF noise on the power line so that you can isolate unwanted RF signals from the power source power source so you can focus on the emissions just coming from your device under test. All right, thank you. Um, what does, please correct me if I'm saying it wrong, SDIP or SDIP 27 testing referred to? I hope you understand what I was reading. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, thank that's you. A, <laughs> no problem. That was in the standard section. Um, I showed that at, at one point when you know, we're talking about one standard referring to the other. I, I don't think I explained it much, so that, that's a good catch. So SDIP 27 is the name 
of a classified standard actually that has to do with Tempest testing. And if anyone hasn't heard of Tempest, that actually stands for something. Let's see if I can get this right. It's telecommunications, electronic materials protected from emanating spurious transmissions, I believe it is. Um, I'll translate what that actually means. Um, with Tempest testing, right, if I take a step back and we just look at EMC, we're always looking for unintended emissions. But for Tempest testing, the important distinction is that you're looking for any kind of unintended spurious emissions that also carry sensitive data. So some customers that are typically interested in doing this type of testing include anyone that doesn't want someone else to skim some important information from a computer. For example, think three letter agencies and the military. So this SDIP 27 is just the classified standard that covers Tempest testing. All right. Um, how often are EMC standards updated and where do you find them? Now, that's a good question. Um, that really depends on which standard we're talking about, right? So during the presentation, we talked about how many different standards bodies there are, and there's just hundreds, if not thousands of standards out there. There's major ones, minor ones, product standards, general standards, and so on. Um, but I think we looked at an example, right? So if I, if I focus on one, like MIL standard 461, we talked in detail a little bit. If memory serves me correctly, over the last few decades, there's typically been a new revision of that 461 standard every six to eight years or so. And that could be different from the commercial space, say like CISPR, uh, where there's working groups that cover individual standards like CISPR 11 and CISPR 25. Um, all of them make new draft versions of their pertinent standards at potentially different times. Um, and sometimes drafts of those standards could only be a couple years apart rather than six to eight years or, or longer or shorter. It, it really depends. So the part of that question I think is most interesting is where do you where do you find them and how do you stay on top of this stuff? Uh, that, that's kind of the, the real challenge, right? Um, as far as where to find the newest standards, a lot of the standards bodies like IEEE, ANSI, and so on, they of course have websites and you can go on there and check to see draft status and the current revisions that are most pertinent to today's type testing. And in many cases, you're going to have to pay to get a copy of the latest standard. And they, they range all over the place from a couple hundred dollars to I've seen some over a thousand dollars. But you can get a PDF copy for whatever it is that you need to do testing wise. And I know, at least from personal experience, I, I was looking at a IEEE standard store recently. I, I believe the ANSI website has a dedicated web store just to find these type of standards. But it, it also kind of doubles as a good way to understand exactly uh, what's most pertinent. All right, I see a few questions coming in. Um, just to, uh, the question is, will you guys get the presentation recording? Yes, everyone who has registered and on the webinar, obviously, will uh, get the presentation. I normally try to send this out one to two business days after the live event. So um, use the same email. If you don't get it within, let's say, Monday to be on the safe side, go ahead and shoot me an email with this email you see on the screen, questions at WLL.com, and I will make sure um, I will send it to you again if you didn't get it the first time. Uh, Jeremy, there were a couple more questions that came in, but I know you have a previous engagement. I do thank you for staying on to go ahead and answer the few questions. So, um, if we did not get to your question, or if you have a question after this webinar, again, please feel free to send your questions to the email you see on the screen, questions at WLL.com, and a member from Roden Swartz uh, will contact you directly. Again, our thanks go out to Jonathan and Jeremy for taking time out to enlighten us about exploring EMC basics and standards. Our next upcoming webinar is covering emission measurements for electrical and electronic equipment on April 15th, actually a week from today at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you haven't already done so, make sure you visit our website to register for this webinar if you're interested. On behalf of the Washington Labs Academy and Roden Swartz, we would like to thank you for all attending. I will now go ahead and end this event. Please enjoy the rest of your day and most importantly, stay safe. Thank you, everyone.